it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Douglas Moo. So here's a man who needs no introduction, but I will give him one anyway. He, Dr. Moo is the Kenneth T. Wessner Professor of Biblical Studies at Wheaton College. He has taught at Wheaton since 2000 after teaching for 23 years at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where he also served as chair of the New Testament department, editor of Trinity Journal, and director of the PhD program in biblical and theological studies. Dr. Mu is also the chair on the Committee of Bible Translation, that is the independent body of scholars, uh, which has oversight over the new international version. He has been on that committee since 1996 and chaired that committee since 2005. He has lectured wildly on translation issues and has written several articles on translation, including, We Still Don't Get It, Evangelicals and Bible Translation 50 Years After James Barr. In addition to all that, he's written or co-written 15 books, including Creation Care. And if you haven't read that book, I have, and it's absolutely wonderful. It is a wonderful odyssey on biblical interpretation and biblical theology. Highly recommended. He lives in West Chicago with his wife, Jenny, who we're also graced to have with us here tonight. Together, they enjoy travel and nature photography. They have five grown children, 13 grandchildren, and with those odds of multiplying, maybe that has gone up since this announcement. I don't know, but in any case, we're honored to have with us Dr. Doug Moo. Thank you, Jason. It is indeed exciting to hear what you're planning to do with the Gospel Initiative. Um, too many Christians are not tackling these issues and are uh, not hearing perhaps what needs to be heard about them. So very gratifying to see that you're uh, trying to do some of these things. Thanks for being with us tonight as we talk about creation care. Uh, I will we'll mention this later in our, our presentation here, uh, but there is a book that all this is based on that Jason just mentioned that my son and I wrote together. My son, Jonathan, who is much more adept at this field than I am. He is much more an expert in these areas than I am. I'm trying to masquerade as someone who knows something about these things, but he's the, he's the real article. Uh, it gives me pleasure to talk about these things with you tonight. My my fundamental point is a simple one that uh, based on scripture, uh, we as believers, uh, evangelical Christians who respect the Bible, uh, need to uh, put creation care on our agenda of issues that we are concerned about as we live out our Christian witness in this world. So that'll be my simple argument tonight and uh, we'll go through things fairly quickly. A lot of this, again, is going to be uh, developed in the book if you're, you're interested in following that up. And if you don't like to read and don't like books, we also have a video series uh, that's available that uh, takes you through that same material. Interesting story about the video. My wife was there. Zondervan decided, you know, if we're doing a video on creation care, we need to do it outdoors. So they rented a house in northern Michigan on a river uh, and set up their, their outdoor studio. Uh, and it took about twice as long to tape as it otherwise would have because they had to stop every time a motorboat went by on the river in the background. So stop, stop, wait until the, wait until the motorboat gets by, you know, and people in the boats would wave to us, you know, and we'll wave back and then back to it again. So, but it was a joy to, it was a joy to do that. And I know a lot of church groups have uh, purchased the video to use it you know, in Sunday school classes and that sort of thing. At any rate, uh, simple outline of what I'm hoping to do tonight. Three basic points, a renewed mind, wisdom, and love. That's the very simple outline of what I'm going to talk about with you very briefly. Let's begin with the renewed mind. And some of you will be familiar, of course, with this famous text in Romans 12, about uh, the renewed mind. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
I'm convinced that this idea of a renewed mind is at the heart of New Testament uh, teaching about how to live successfully as a Christian in this world. And what it refers to is a very fundamental reorientation of the way we think about everything. A lot of these topics that Jason just introduced you to are not ones you're gonna find addressed directly in scripture anywhere. You're not gonna be able to open your concordance under Christian nationalism and find any verses. Uh, how do we approach these issues from a genuine Christian perspective? We, we do it if we have a renewed mind that has been transformed by the work of God's spirit and our immersion in the word of God and the people of God. So a renewed mind aligning all our values in keeping with the sweep of the biblical story. Uh, understanding what scripture is teaching, how it develops, what its storyline is, what its values are that we learn as we see how that story progresses. Taking those on board and in a sense, uh, if we may use the analogy, reprogramming our onboard computers so that they do not think as the world thinks, but they begin to think and operate in accordance with genuine biblical kingdom values. So let's get a sense of this biblical storyline with a focus on the created world. A lot of us know the biblical storyline very well, but our focus not unnaturally tends to be on the way humans uh, are portrayed in the biblical story and how they are the key actors on the stage. And I don't wanna take anything away from that. Clearly there is a tremendous focus on humans and how God is working in history to redeem humans and to make them his people and to bless them. Of course, that's a huge theme. I think sometimes, however, we have missed the element of the created world that is there also as part of the uh, activity going on in this drama of redemption. Thank you very much. Creation, our first act then in this uh, drama of redemption uh, in which we see God appointing us as God's stewards of a good world. Genesis 1, we all know this material, I'm sure. Seven times God pronounces that the creation he brought into being is good. We get hung up on the issue of how to relate Genesis 1 to science. Maybe hung up is not the right way to put it. It's a valid issue that we need to talk about. But obviously that's not what Genesis 1 is fundamentally about. Genesis 1 and 2, the creation stories, trying to teach certain values, certain points about God and the world and humans place in that world. And a key text that, that, that reminds us of our place in the world is the famous image of God language. God makes mankind in our image, God speaking in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. It is widely recognized these days by biblical scholars that the concept of the image of God includes the notion of being sub-regents under God's benevolent, graceful rule. That image has that notion of dynamic ruling built within it. To be in the image of God then is to be charged with overseeing the world that God has brought into being. And note that the word here is rule, which is indeed a pretty strong word. What does this rule look like from scripture? Very important to recognize that this is not a matter of our taking dictatorial power over the created world. Sometimes this verse has been taken in that way, but that misses the point scripture is making with the language. Rather, we are to be appointed as wise and loving stewards accountable to the ruler. So the whole earth is God's. Again and again, the scripture reminds us that this creation is his world, is his possession. And our ruling of this world is a ruling that uh, exists only under the ultimate kingship and the ultimate rulership of God himself. And again, 
the analogy of the steward is one that is you know, widely being used now by people thinking about these things as trying to capture that notion of being appointed as people to look after something God has given us to look after. And the question becomes, how are we going to be the wise stewards that God wants us to be? In the Genesis account itself, interesting in chapter two, uh, the language shifts a little bit to working, and you could even translate that Hebrew word serve and take care of it. Here the image is of the farmer caring for his fields, trying to develop his land in a way that will make it fruitful and productive over many years so that it, pr it produces a crop that uh, can be grown and sold and used for food. That's kind of the imagery here we have in Genesis 2 in terms of humans appointed to a certain role in the garden, ultimately, of course, to the earth as a whole. Well, we all know that the story didn't end there. Uh, sadly, uh, humans fell into sin. Uh, and we now exist as fallen stewards of God's good world. The care for the world, the created world, as stewards is something that is embedded in Israel's law. If you've uh, recently read through what we call the Torah, the uh, commandments that God gave to the people of Israel through Moses, uh, you might be surprised to see how many references there are to care for the land and to care for animals. This is just one text among many we, we could cite. If you come across a bird's nest beside the road, either in a tree or on the ground, and the mother is sitting on the young or on the eggs, do not take the mother with the young. You may take the young, but be sure to let the mother go so that it may go well with you and you may live, uh, you may have a long life. Here, there's a concern for what we today call sustainability. Uh, that the mother be left to produce other offspring so that the, 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 these birds don't come to an end as it were, as a species. Uh, that's the concern we have embedded in the law here. And again, if you look through the law, you'll find so many references to the way we are to be concerned about caring for the land, for the animals that live on the land, and again, stewarding these things for the sake of creation and to the honor of God. Unfortunately, again, our stewardship, that is to be a benevolent stewardship, uh, has often uh, fallen into a selfish exploitation of the earth, where humans begin thinking that the created world is there simply for our benefit only. And obviously, the creation is given for our benefit, but it's that our benefit only that has led to exploitation of the created world that has led to these difficulties we're gonna talk about later on that we now see in the world around us and that betray uh, the fundamental nature of what our stewardship should be, serving the land, for the sake of God, the ultimate owner of the land, and being accountable and responsible to him for the way we do it. The Old Testament recognizes the problem here. The earth is defiled by its people. They've disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. The earth is defiled by human sin. And Paul in Romans 8, a text we'll look at again in a moment, talks about the groaning of the creation as a result, again, of human sin. In the midst of all of this, all is not negative. Very important for us to see, yes, the fall took place, the relationship of humans and the created world has been disrupted. There, there, there has exists now a disharmony in that relationship that God ultimately is seeking to heal. But this word, world is still a wonderful diverse world testifying to the glory of God. We, we could read all of Psalm 104 here, but it's a long Psalm and we're not gonna do that. Here's just a, a fragment of this Psalm. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. There the birds make their nests, the stork has its home in the junipers, the high mountains belong to the wild goats, the crags, crags are a refuge for the hyrax. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. How many are your works, Lord? 
In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Just the astonishing diversity of life that God has chosen to give us. When Jenny and I are out for some of our nature walks in a part of the world that's not famous for its nature, the suburbs of Chicago, we nevertheless are, are constantly uh, astonished, I don't think is too strong a word, to see the, the beauty of the wildflowers, for instance, that spring up in April in our part of the world and into May. The intricate way those flowers are made, their variety of color and shape and texture. But why did God do that? He didn't have to do that. Goes, okay, one flower, okay, that's all we need, you know. But uh, no, we have this incredible beauty and the diversity of the created world around us. And that's what the Psalm is celebrating and reminding us about the goodness of this diverse, beautiful creation God has given us. Act three, new creation or restoration inaugurated. The language of new creation occurs only twice in the New Testament, both times in the Apostle Paul, Galatians and 2 Corinthians. In both verses, there is some debate among scholars about what new creation refers to. There's a tendency among some to think that the reference is solely to the relationship of humans to God. Some translations indeed in 2 Corinthians 5 especially render we are new creatures in Christ. Some of you have probably heard the language that way and it might resonate uh, in your, your memory in terms of, of what that language might be doing there. Um, I'm convinced, however, that new creation is a big idea that covers all that God is intending to do through Jesus' first and second coming. It is a very broad, all-embracing idea. To put it another way, for our purposes tonight, uh, I want to argue that creation needs to be kept part of new creation, uh, not eliminated or omitted with simply a reference to humans only. Now, you don't read very far in the Apostle Paul that you know he's talking about humans mainly. Again and again, that's his concern about how people can come to know Christ as Lord, about how they need to live faithful lives as Jesus followers. Clearly, that's the focus of Paul. We don't want to take anything away from that. Please don't misunderstand me on that point. All I want to do is say, I think we have shrunk the concept when we limit it to humans and fail to see the breadth of what God is doing in his restoration work. So new creation involves, yes, God reconciling humans to God, humans to humans. That's part of his new creation work, the creation of a community, and of course, the uh, humans to the created world. All of these are facets of new creation. Paul is picking up here, although the language isn't the same, Isaiah, famous texts in Isaiah at the end of his prophecy about God creating new heavens and new earth. And again, Paul, I think, is picking that up. And new creation language is, is used in Jewish texts like this one in this very broad, all-embracing way. The day of the new creation and the heaven and the earth and all their creatures shall be renewed. This was in the air in Paul's day in terms of what God was intending to do and this is what he's expressing in his new creation language. The universal sweep of reconciliation is found in other texts. For instance, Colossians 1, 19 to 20, the climax of this wonderful passage about Jesus and his glory and his deity. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that is Christ, and through him, Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Reconciliation extends beyond humans to God. It embraces all things in the created world ultimately. So God's program of restoration must include the created world itself. Here, 
I just want to remind us of what some of us may know already, that the New Testament operates with a tension between what we call the already and the not yet. So this act of, reconcil of reconciliation in Colossians 1, or the new creation of Galatians and 2 Corinthians, have this already not yet aspect. Already, God is introducing certain elements of his new creation work. Already, he is engaged in reconciling. But we look ahead to the second coming of Christ, to the moment when the work will be finished, when reconciliation will be complete, when the new creation will be brought in in all its fullness and glory. So as we look at these texts about new creation and reconciliation, we always have to remember that it's this two-step process we are talking about. How about restoration consummated as we move now toward this moment that I've called the not yet moment in salvation history. Restoration consummated. Revelation 21.5, the seer there reminds us through the words of God, I, God, am making everything new. It's important to see that this text does not say, I am making all new things. In other words, the image here is not of decreation and recreation of something brand new, replacing the old. The image here is one of renewal, of making all things new. And this idea of renewal is picked up by Paul in a text we mentioned earlier, but now we come back to Romans 8, 19 to 22. Very important passage because again, Paul does not say a lot about the created world. He focuses on humans most of the time. So these texts become outsized in importance. The creation, Paul writes, waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The creation was subjected to frustration. Here's the fall into sin, you see, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. But it was subjected in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Again, an image of continuity, an image of renewal and renovation of this creation liberated from its bondage to decay. How about 2 Peter 3 though? Some of you will immediately think of this text and we're talking about the destiny of the created world. Because Peter uses some strong language here about the end of this creation. Look at the language of destroy three times. References to fire and heat, burning up the elements, everything destroyed. Here's a text that seems to contradict what we have seen in Revelation and in Romans. Here we seem to have the image of a thorough annihilation of this world. However, a closer look makes it clear that maybe it's not all going to burn, as we sometimes hear it said. If you look at this text, number one, understand that the language of fire is frequently metaphorical in scripture. It's frequently used not uh, to talk about an actual or literal burning, but as an image, as a metaphor for God's judgment. Uh, I think you have that here in Isaiah 65, one text among many, many Old Testament passages that we could cite to make that point. In addition to that, within 2 Peter 3 itself, he also talks about the world of Noah being destroyed, verse six. As we all know, the flood of Noah's day did not annihilate the earth. The flood cleansed the world. How, how broadly, how universally is debated. We don't need to get in that debate here. The point is this, the destruction of the world in Noah's day clearly doesn't mean the annihilation of that world. It means it's thorough cleansing so that a new start could be made, but not annihilation. So when we put this data together, I think the texts about the continuity of the created world become much more significant and much more uh, the center of scripture 
than these texts that might suggest destruction. Renewal, not annihilation, is the point here. Now let me pause to uh, exit the biblical story just for a moment to uh, speak a word of application. In one sense, I think it is fair to say that if we view this creation as continuing into the eternal world, the new heavens and new earth, that might give us a little bit more incentive to care for it. But it is certainly not the basis to care for our created world. I think the analogy of the human body here. Uh, scripture is clear that God is the one who is going to resurrect our bodies one day. That's what we are destined for. And there's discontinuity there. However, uh, the point here would be that we still take care of our bodies. We try to take care of them as best we can while we have them, whatever the destiny of that body might be. And so the application to the creation as well. So it's kind of the point I'm making on this next slide where we see Jesus' resurrection setting a pattern of discontinuity and continuity. Jesus' body seems different in his resurrected state than it did earlier. People don't immediately recognize him. He's able to apparently materialize in the midst of a closed locked room door, locked door room. Uh, and yet uh, you can stick your hand in his side where the, uh, uh, implica where, where the, the impact of the crucifixion is readily seen. I think that helps us understand the renovation of creation here and again, caring for my body, caring for creation-related ideas here, I think, helps us understand this. Our ultimate destiny, it's another thing we need to factor into the situation here a little bit. Many of us think of our ultimate destiny as heaven, some ethereal, spiritual experience, floating up in the clouds somewhere, perhaps. Various images come to mind, which I'm trying to illustrate here. And it's true that if we die before Jesus returns, before the new creation is fully inaugurated, we will be in heaven with Jesus who is there already ahead of us. But ultimately, at the end of the day, when God's work is completed and the eternal state is brought in, our destiny is not heaven, our destiny is a new heaven and new earth. I'm going to spend eternity on the front range of the Rocky Mountains. This is actually, if you recognize the site a little bit deeper into Colorado, near Ridgeway, uh, the Dallas Divide. Um, this is a photograph of that. Uh, this is where I'm gonna spend eternity, in, in a new heaven, a new earth, a renewed Colorado, because uh, I love the topography of Colorado, having been sentenced to live in the Chicago area for almost all my life. Okay, a, a renewed mind. I'm gonna go much more quickly over the next two. Uh, we need a renewed mind that is thinking along the lines that God has given us in terms of our role as stewards. What does that look like? What does that mean? What are the values that we are to steward this creation by? Uh, but we also need practical, specific guidance on how to do that well. Just as someone appointed the steward of a farm needs to learn about that farm, what its good points are, what its bad points are, which fields need fertilizer, which ones don't, which field needs to lie fallow this year uh, so that it can be more productive the next year, on and on and on. To steward something well, you need to know about it. And I think biblical wisdom uh, suggests this idea for us as we think about stewarding the creation world. The discerning heart seeks knowledge Solomon's wisdom had to do with the natural world to some extent, as this text in 1 Kings reminds us. A wise person is one who governs his or her life in accordance with the reality of the world as God has made it. So there are many things we need to learn about this world we live in, but particularly in our point in history, we need to recognize that the groaning of the earth has become pretty acute. Evidence of this is all around us and is accumulating daily through various scientific studies in various spheres of, of, of expertise all over the world. 
And I'm no expert on this. My son knows this material much better than I. Uh, but just to give you a sample that you are probably many of you already aware of in terms of what's going on. The earth is full of your creatures, Psalm 104, the delight of the world God has made in its diversity, which is being dramatically undercut. 69% fewer wild vertebrates now, 2022, than in 1970. 32 years Look at the change that's taken place, mainly through loss of habitat. Loss of topsoil, certain farming practices that are productive in the short term have the effect of just using up the soil. So one wonders again what the future of agriculture is gonna be in Iowa as the topsoil continues to disappear. You see the rate it's disappearing now. Climate change, the elephant in the room. Climate change is really a fairly simple concept at base. It talks about the greenhouse effect as fundamental to what's happening in the climate around us. The greenhouse effect is simply understood. The sun hitting the earth, radiation occurs, which warms, of course, the air around us. And the more greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, we pump into the atmosphere, the more there becomes a barrier preventing that radiation from escaping, and so we get warmer. So it's exactly the same principle when you pull the covers up over yourself at night. Uh, the radiation of your body is trapped by those covers, keeping the radiation from escaping and warming you. So the fundamental scientific principle is really obvious. It's something that we all experience. Uh, those of us who garden and have greenhouses know how this works. And again, the science of these greenhouse gases and the effect that they have on the climate uh, have been well known since the early 1800s. A uh, number of scientists in the 19th uh, century were already talking about this and how it's going to function, making predictions that are eerily accurate in terms of what's going on in our own day. Here's a graph illustrating the point uh, that uh, if natural factors alone were involved, and obviously over millennia, over centuries, climate has always been variable. It's always been changing. That's nothing new, certainly. But it's the rate of change in our era that is startling. Uh, so again, a graph showing the variations you would expect with natural factors only on the bottom, and then what we observe actually happening as the temperature of the Earth regularly increases, leading to climate change. Global warming used to be the phrase we used, and that's true to some degree. There's a lot of warming going on, but some parts of the world will, will actually get cooler. It's climate change, therefore, not just global warming. And there can be a tendency for us to say, well, so what? You know, if uh, global warming hits where I live, uh, I'll just uh, save money on my heating bill. Sometimes in a Chicago winter, global warming sounds pretty good. Uh, and we can, we can all understand how people might feel about that. But what we need to appreciate is the enormous impact some of this will have on certain parts of the world. Farmers in Africa who are used to planting a certain crop where they live, and suddenly that crop doesn't work there any longer because things have warmed up too much. Do they move? Well, you can imagine a lot of those people don't have the wherewithal to move. They just can't easily pick up stakes and move somewhere else. Maybe they learn to plant a new crop. Yes, but that's gonna take time and that might not be easy. They've been used to farming a particular crop for a long time, right through their family history. Now suddenly that crop doesn't work anymore because of the way the warming has taken place. You can just impacts like this uh, multiply and I'll talk about some more later on. You've all seen the statistics, I'm sure, about Arctic sea ice. Again, another clear indication of global warming. Uh, and at the same time, as that ice melts, it uh, turns into liquid form, obviously, and raises the level of the oceans, creating problems in parts of the world. You've all seen probably slides giving you photographs of this sort, the way our glaciers are shrinking. Within a decade or so, there probably will be no more glaciers in Glacier National Park. 
Um, and again, this has not just detracts from our viewing experience, but more seriously, again, brings water into the oceans, raising the ocean level, making it difficult for certain parts of the world to, 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 to thrive. Chris Wright, an Old Testament scholar and a writer on Old Testament ethics especially, summarizes it like this, and I think he's right. Only a willful blindness worse than any proverbial ostrich's head in the sand could ignore the facts of environmental destruction and its accelerating pace. As we steward the world under God's guidance and lordship, we need to be aware of these problems and seek solutions to steward God's creation well. Finally, love. Sometimes I think it's the simplest way to present the mandate for creation care for those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus is simply to be reminded of the two great love commandments. Love God by faithfully storied his creation. Love others, our neighbors, by providing a healthy and sustainable environment for them to inhabit. Take again the effects of climate change on ocean levels. Well, I'll come to that in a moment. Sorry, I forgot I had this slide in here. Others extended in space and extended in time. I couldn't complete a presentation without a picture of my grandchildren. So um, the others I am called upon to love are my grandchildren and their children after them and their children after them. Sometimes we are too easily involved in simply kicking the ball down the field, uh, putting these problems into the next generation and just getting tired of trying to deal with them ourselves. But as we fail to deal with these problems, they become exponentially harder to deal with and we're leaving up a really problematic legacy for those who come after us. Extended in space, here's the estimate of what's going to happen in Bangladesh if the climate continues to change and the oceans continue to rise as people now predict it will. 15 million people affected, losing their land, not able to grow crops on it any longer, not able to live on it any longer in many cases. 15 million people affected. Well, you know, things like this are gonna affect cities like Miami as well. What's the difference? Look at the comparison of the GDP. Miami can afford to build seawalls, to elevate their highways as they're already doing because of the effects of the rising sea are being felt in Miami and other coastal areas. They can afford to do that. Look at their GDP. But look at the GDP of people in Bangladesh. They can't afford to do these kinds of things. At a certain point, again, climate change, I'm sorry, creation care is simply a species of biblical social justice. Here's a map that kind of reminds us of this. As climate change takes place, the countries who have produced the most greenhouse gases are going to be perhaps least affected. Countries that do not produce nearly as much greenhouse gas over time because they've not been industrialized are gonna feel the real brunt of climate change. So in a very simple way, what does it mean for me to love the other? What does it mean to love my brother and sister? Not people who live next door to me, but as Jesus reminded us in the parable of the Good Samaritan, that love needs to extend beyond the usual boundaries we might set for it as we look at people at different parts of the world being adversely affected by climate change. In conclusion, photo credits to Doug and Jenny Moo. All the photographs you've seen here were taken by us and I've been trying to make a subtle point by including them, not just because I like to show off our photography, but because all of these were taken except one, which I'm sure you can name, within 20 miles of our house in the Chicago suburbs. Um, 
just appreciating the world of nature around us. And one, I think, way in which we can become involved more in, 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 in creation care is by appreciating the creation itself more, getting out in it and enjoying it. A lot of us lead very urbanized lives in which, which, in which we are insulated from the created world. I think one of the things we can do to foster creation care is to get out in that created world more where we can learn to appreciate it. And finally, just to mention again, the book I talked about earlier, written by my son and me on creation care, where we attempt to put a lot of this together. A lot that I've talked about tonight is expanded and elaborated in various ways in that book and accompanying video series. Thank you for listening. I assume it's all right for to take uh, questions now. So. Q&A, so there it is. Uh, we'll use this mic for Q&A, so if you have a question, you raise your hand, I'll come over to you and, and hold the mic. And if you attempt to wrestle it away from me, I will, I will be stubborn and obstinate because we want to get your question on record so that that way uh, the recording makes sense and gives continuity for those of us who aren't in the room. So, questions? This is really more a, a comment, uh, an affirmation, than a question. I just read yesterday a news article about um, fungi, giant fungi that live underground. And as we farm and till the soils, uh, we're destroying their carbon sink. Mm. They hold it just like above the ground plants do. And as we destroy their ability to store up um, carbon dioxide, we're releasing more of it into mm. the air. And so while we think of burning fossil fuels as the problem, and it is, um, the decimation of God's natural buffers for all of that carbon dioxide continues to be discovered in places that we had never realized before. Mm. And so over tilling of the ground is just one more contributor to that, which that's, kind of blew my mind. I, I never heard that, that's fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think we've all heard about the, 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 the vital role that the forests play around the earth in absorbing right, and the deforestation that's such a problem in places like the Amazon basin and so forth. Never heard about this under the ground stuff going on. Really fascinating. Thank you. In the whole area of creation care, uh, realizing there may be quite a few folks who care about this topic but are not believers, what would you say are the one or two most uh, opportune ways to disciple hmm. or um, in the spirit of apologetics speak to others who care about this issue but aren't believers? Sure, uh, I, I don't want to offend anybody by what I say. It's very easy to do that because it's, it's a controversial topic for some, I realize I don't intend to offend anybody. But I think many people who are committed to creation care can look at Christians as the enemy. Uh, there are people, all they're concerned about is saving souls, uh, and that's it. And we should be concerned about saving souls. We shouldn't be apologetic about that or retract one iota from that. Please don't get me wrong. <laughs> that needs to be fundamental to who we are and what we're about. We're unapologetic about that. But the degree to which we can demonstrate to the non-Christian that our, our Christian worldview leads me to get involved in environmental care the way you are for other reasons, I think that, that commends our faith to people uh, on the outside. So I think that is one really powerful uh, impulse that we could have. I think, again, Christians bring something significant to the, uh, the uh, understanding of these things as many of you will know, there are extremes in environmentalism in which um, uh, animals and plants are really put over humans sometimes. Um, Edward Abbey, a famous radical environmentalist in the early years, desert solitaire, some of you remember all this back far enough. No, it doesn't look like it. Um, uh, famously said, I would rather kill uh, a human than a snake. And that kind of attitude is out there and uh, as Christians, I think we have a distinct perspective to speak into this, to recognize humans are the only 
ones created in the image of God. Humans do have a unique place in God's created world and purposes. But we also have this responsibility to steward well the creation God has given us. And so I think the kind of balance that Christian theology brings to this is something that can be usefully brought into the way we conceive of environmental uh, activism, as it were. Why do you think that um, the creation and the garden is kind of glossed over? I mean, we were created to live in a garden and, you know, it was pre-fall. Mm -hmm. um, why is it that we, we forget that? That we forget the, the garden aspect? Well, that we were, you know, we, we were initially created to live in a garden. Why don't we treat the earth as a garden, oh. you know, kind of thing? Yeah, we've kind of lost that imagery. Although, you know, it's interesting, the biblical story starts out in a garden and ends in a city. Uh, not sure exactly what we're to make of that, but, you know, the image that the Revelation uses in chapters 21 and 22 is the new Jerusalem, the city that comes down from heaven where uh, the, the people of the Lord in, in inhabit the, 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 the city. But again, there is a continuity there. The Garden of Eden, in a sense, becomes the land of Israel. There's a relationship there. And then that land of Israel ultimately comes for us, the new heaven and new earth. So that garden is extended and expanded, in a sense, by humans uh, as we uh, extend the mandate that God has given us to, to rule well as shepherds. Um, I hope I get this right. So how, in, one of the biggest things, especially running into another political season, is this particular issue becomes politicized so easily. Sure. And so what would be, do you have recommended sources or, or tricks to discerning what's real information versus yeah. not and yeah. um, besides our favorite people, you know, kind of thing. Sure. So, okay. That is a huge problem in all walks of life these days, isn't it? Where do we get reliable data? Uh, the internet is full of unreliable data. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of common sense, the sites you look at. When I'm trying to look up a health issue I have, Mayo Clinic, yeah, I'm gonna look at that site. You know, uh, Dr. Uh, Fuzzbob, who, uh, you know, has uh, created his first website, uh, I might not pay much attention to that. I'll skip over that one, thank you. So there is a lot of good information out there. And one good place to go, kind of a clearinghouse for good information, is the Evangelical Environmental Network, E-E-N, Evangelical Environmental Network. So again, it's set up as a kind of clearinghouse for all kinds of information about the climate, uh, resources to talk about creation care as we have this evening. Uh, so that would be a good place to start, certainly. Another organization you may or may not be familiar with is an organization called Arosha. Uh, a space R-O-C-H-A, I think it's Portuguese in, or, in, in, in origin. Uh, it, it's, it's a movement focused on Christians involved in creation care, but in a practical, local way. They have local chapters where, again, they're not interested so much in the theory. They're interested in how can we improve the environment here in my neighborhood where I live. And so they uh, band together and do all kinds of projects together. They, they analyze local issues and try to speak into those. Uh, so a wonderful organization to kind of, work if you want to get your hands dirty, as it were, uh, in terms of what environmental activism might look like as a Christian. A-R-O-C-H-A, Arosha. Yeah, thank you both uh, for bringing up the uh, stewardship concept. I take that to heart. Um, you brought up a quote from the Old Testament about how humans have been defiling the earth for thousands of years. If that's true, why do you believe that we as humans deserve the earth? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I would use the word deserve. I think this world is a gracious gift God has given us, and we have not taken care of that gift very well, to be sure. Uh, what's amazing is that for all of our 
problems, all the issues we've created as humans on the earth, the earth still is a wonderful place uh, in so many ways. Um, so that's something to be thankful for. So again, do we deserve it? No, probably not. We don't deserve much as sinful humans. But we do have this earth given to us as a gift from God to, to live in until the new heaven and new earth should come with, again, our responsibility to care our best for it while we're here. Uh, thanks again. Um, I appreciate this as sort of a uh, follow-up. You know, Dr. Sandra Richter, Richter was here uh, a while back, yeah, and that, talked about this. Um, she, she mentioned, and you had mentioned it briefly too, about um, maybe the breakdown in eschatology and how that informs the way we look at creation care. And when I think about, just from a pastoral perspective, like how I help my congregation to consider creation care more, um, you know, things are so politicized and global warming seems so huge of a thing, like how do I make a difference? And to me, it seems like the one thing I can help them with mostly is to inform them uh, with a more healthy eschatology. Mm -hmm. I mean, I even had a, an old pastor of mine used to have this phrase, STBA, scheduled to burn anyways. So who cares, save souls, yeah. that kind of... Um, I've heard that a lot, yeah. Yeah, and so how? what's the best way when um, so few of our hours are spent doing formation with our, our people, you know, and they're maybe more informed by cable news or by their neighbors, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to help them with their eschatology and how that informs them in creation care? Yeah, two things to, to say to that in terms of what we do in a church context. Again, I'm, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should detract one iota from evangelism, discipleship, these fundamental things that God has called us to do as a church. All I'm saying is that in terms of our posture with respect to the world, care for creation should be part of that posture. It doesn't necessarily demand a great deal of time or effort it just means a reorientation of our thinking so that we ask legitimate questions when we walk into the ballot box to vote. Uh, should creation care be one of the issues we're concerned about when we choose what candidates to vote for? I think it should be. Uh, it's not the only issue that I'm going to choose a candidate on, but it is going to be one issue on the list of things that as a Christian with a renewed mind, I'm concerned about. Eschatology does have a bearing uh, I don't think it has a decisive bearing, though, as I said before. Uh, even if it is all going to burn, even if that's right, which I don't think it is, I still think our mandate to care for the created world as long as we are here and it is here is still very demanding on us. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a dumb question. Why is this an issue? Why is it a controversial issue? And I'll tell you the background. We were biology majors at Wheaton 35, 40 years ago. You don't, you don't, you don't need ago. to go into details, that's all right. But think Albert Smith and Dorothy Chapel, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. So this is our complete understanding of creation and the biology that we, that we learned and have now actually lived out in our careers. Um, so why is it a controversial issue? Well, I think a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, not everybody, of course, has had the kind of wonderful Wheaton education that you've been able to have. Uh, and a lot of Christians have just never sat in a church where this was even mentioned as an issue. Um, never comes up. I think that's uh, you know, a kind of responsibility of pastors and their preaching program and their teaching program a failure, I think, on their part. So people sometimes are hostile and it's controversial, but, but I find more people just apathetic. Now, why are, are a lot of people hostile? I, you know, I get in trouble for mentioning this name. I think Al Gore had it right. It's an inconvenient truth. Because if it's true that climate change is happening, and it is damaging the environment and harming other people around the world, that might mean I have to change my lifestyle. That might mean I have to buy a smaller car than I would necessarily like to have. That might mean I need to turn the temperature in my house down a little bit so I'm not quite as comfortable as I used to be. Uh, oh, wait a minute, we Americans, that's interfering with my lifestyle. 
No, 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 that's sacrosanct. And that's true, I'm afraid, even in the Christian church. So I think that's one reason it's controversial. Another reason, of course, is like so many things in our day, uh, it's become hijacked as a political issue. Um, where there's a lot of misinformation that gets fed into it. And then, you know, you sort of, well, depends on the kind of uh, person you are, where you are on the political spectrum, whether you are going to go along with climate change or not. They get tied together. I don't, I, for the life of me, I don't understand how any appropriate, reasonable definition of conservative demands that I deny climate change. But that's, that's the profile, isn't it, in American politics these days. Do, do you think this is a, a, an American evangelical issue? It's more American than, than other places, but it is true of the Western world in a general way. But uh, again, we, Jenny and I have traveled quite extensively in Europe, lived in Europe for, for periods of time. Uh, and a lot of the things we are fighting over here are just aren't issues there at all. Uh, so it is not, that hasn't risen to the same level. It's part of this is our American exceptionalism and our emphasis on freedom. I have the right to do whatever I want with my house, with my car, with my money. That's the nature of American life. That's the ethos of the American dream, as it were. Uh, and so I think the U.S. does tend to be a bit of an outlier on this. And then is it, a Western issue as opposed to a majority world issue. No, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say entirely no, because I, you know I think if we fall into the trap of thinking, oh, Western world bad, majority world good. No, it's 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 mixed across the board. We have to recognize that there are upper classes in the majority in, in, in the minority world where these things are, are are equally problematic because they've attained a certain lifestyle and they want to keep it. Would you say also that in in addition to just the idea of keeping a lifestyle, though, uh, it's important to keep in mind that there are people groups in the United States that are affected differently by this. Right. Yeah. So an inconvenient truth for someone that's in New Mexico, uh, and natural gas is what they have. Yeah. Or Appalachia and coal is what they have. Sure. Right? It's a terrifying thing. It is. Uh, yeah, my, not just inconvenient, but, no, but terrifying. No, I, and we need to recognize that. Um, my uh, brother-in-law uh, lives in southern Kentucky. His business was servicing coal mines. And um, yeah, he's you know, testified to us the dramatic uh, impact that uh, the, the, lack, the, 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 the turning away from coal has had, uh, which of course is happening for economic reasons now more than for environmental reasons. But, that, that's another story. In general though, yeah, we have to recognize that any kind of change of this kind is going to uh, give opportunity for some industries that weren't there before, look at the electric car industry right now, uh, and is gonna harm people in other industries. And we have to figure out how to help those people who are potentially getting left behind as these things change. Some of that change is happening anyway, whether Environmentalism or climate change is a part of it or not. They're just economic forces that are, are causing change here. But I, I honor the point you're making. We need to pay attention to groups that are really vulnerable here uh, and are gonna be harmed by this kind of change. All right, well, thank you all for paying attention tonight and coming out and listening. Uh, uh, trust that uh, you will go and uh, become creation care people. <laughs> <laughs>